So, All right, so um, it is time to get started. All right, okay. Thanks everybody for um, being here. We have our sixth speaker of the day. Um, introducing him is his mentor, um, Federic Rotman. He's the vice president of the hatchery operations at Blue Ocean Mariculture. And um, he has been actively engaged in aquaculture industry for over 25 years and so his uh <laughs> anyway so uh and uh at, but he was brought into blue um ocean mariculture a year and a half ago two years ago 20 years ago, and then again, oh. a year and a half ago. So 20 years ago, and then, yes, so he's, uh, anyway, um, and he has, um, is in charge of seeing the production from the early stages all the way through to full fish, which Alejandro will um, explain in detail, but I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, First of all, I'm really bummed I missed the presentation until now, and I unfortunately have to get back in my truck and drive to Kona because we've got a hatchery full of fish, which is a, a good problem to have, but the life of a fish farmer is a nonstop roller coaster. Really exciting, as Alejandro experienced. Um, on, notes. Um, so speaking of Alejandro, I'm truly honored to be able to introduce him. Um, I've worked with many students through the years. I've been very fortunate and have positions where I was able to collaborate with universities and, and research institutes. And um, I can say that Alejandro is a prime example of just a really good human being and very professional, intelligent, motivated. I mean, really just somebody with a really bright future. And I'm just really happy to do that. a small part of his career. Um, so the other part of this story, which is kind of fun, is that Alejandro stepped into his internship during probably one of the most tumultuous phases of our 20 year company history. Um, our company is, it was, so I was, I was out there for my first 10 years of my career, which kind of like a lot of you guys, I came out of a program that focused on um, many aspects of science and environment at the University of Miami. And I was given this opportunity to come out here and spent my first 10 years professionally um, in Kona um, and uh, seeing how your program produces people like Alejandro is just really exciting because it's just there's a ton of opportunity out there and you guys are in all these I was looking through all the different um, titles and, and talks and it's just like wow there's so many cool opportunities that you guys are going to be involved in and it's just a great time to do what you guys are doing and we need people like you guys. So, um, but anyway, so I kind of stepped into a really challenging part of our history, third ownership um, and a um, ton of investment, a ton of pressure to produce fish and we couldn't. And he, his three months there were basically spent troubleshooting and repairing <laughs> construction. He'll talk about this. So I'm not going to I'm not going to uh, steal his thunder, but it was really cool. And I think that he performed better than anybody could have in the, during, in this, uh, given the circumstances. So I'll hand over the, uh, the conch to you. And uh, <laughs> cool. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I think the end. <laughs> 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 You're gonna get me singing up here. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello. My name is uh, Alejandro Camaño Valientos, and today I will be talking about the implementation of sustainable methods for seafood production, uh, specifically in reference to the work that I did at Blue Ocean Mariculture. Uh, so I would first like to start off by thanking my committee members, uh, Lisa Canale, who is the University of Hawaii at Hilo, Tropical Conservation Biology and Environmental Science Internship Program Coordinator, as well as my agency mentor, Federico Rotman, who is the Vice President of Hatchery Operations at Blue Ocean Mariculture. 
So I'd like to start off with a brief introduction. Uh, over the past few decades, capture fisheries yield has stagnated due to the overexploitation of wild fish stocks. And as a result, uh, aquaculture production has grown exponentially to meet that increased seafood demand while also helping to establish food security for global populations. However, some of the uh, practices within the industry have been deemed environmentally unsustainable as they have the potential to degrade local ecosystems and habitats. One issue that commonly arises is uh, nutrient enrichment, which arises from high densities of these cultured fish being confined in one area, which will, uh, their waste products can accumulate leading to the eutrophication as shown in that top right picture. Um, this can ultimately lead to low oxygen or anoxic conditions within the surrounding environment. Uh, another issue that will uh, arise from these high densities of animals is uh, increased disease transmission, not only within your tanks, but also uh, potential introductions to these wild stocks. Uh, this is a huge issue within uh, the industry as it can constrain the production of your final seafood product uh, by limiting both the quantity as well as the quality of what is produced. Another issue would be the um, fish uh, escaping from their enclosures and establishing themselves as invasive, uh, which can increase local competition or predation interactions or introduce novel interactions that were not present beforehand. One way to prevent long-term uh, impacts of this would be rendering these cultured fish uh, sterile so they can't uh, propagate within those uh, environments. And then finally, um, also a best option would be just avoiding species outside of their natural home ranges, which can further negate uh, any impacts of them establishing as invasive. Finally, uh, the demands on wild fish stocks must be considered as uh, uh, feeds are largely composed of either fish meal or fish oil. Uh, this is particularly true with carnivorous species. So for my internship, I worked with Blue Ocean Mariculture. Uh, they are located in Kailua Kona on uh, the island of Hawaii, and they have successfully incorporated sustainable methods and considerations into both their production uh, establishment as well as production. Uh, so their marine pens are situated in deep water that feature very strong ocean currents, which will quickly diffuse any excess waste products that uh, could potentially lead to nutrient enrichment. This is compounded by the fact that they uh, limit their fish densities, so further mitigating uh, nutrient enrichment problems while also preventing disease transmissions. They've also elected to raise Almaco Jack, which is known locally as Kahala, and marketed as Hawaiian Kampachi. And this will eliminate the, eliminate the potential for any escaped animals from establishing themselves as invasive. And finally, their feeds are readily converted into the uh, body tissue of these fish, which will limit the use of fish meal and fish oil during production. So giving a very brief overview of the hatchery, which is the onshore component of their operations, uh, this is where I had my entire internship experience. And the overarching goal is to breed fish that are then reared through their uh, larval and early juvenile stages of development until we can transfer them to the offshore component of operations. And to obtain this goal, um, we uh, use four different departments, uh, broodstock, live feeds, larval rearing, and nursery, which each play their own uh, key integral role into uh, achieving those objectives. So the broodstock is where we will optimize fish health as well as their reproductive output in terms of both quantity and quality of that egg being produced. The live feeds department is going to produce large quantities of rotifer and artemia live feeds, which will be fed out to these larval fish during their early stages of development. Within the larval rearing department, these eggs are hatched and larvae are reared until they are large enough to be transferred into the nursery habitat where they will continue to grow until we can uh, eventually move them offshore. This will uh, conclude that uh, operations for that specific cohort of fish. And this is a term that you'll hear me use a lot, uh, cohort of fish, like what is that? It's essentially a batch of fish that is produced by the hatchery. And it's commonly uh, abbreviated to um, SR followed by a number. 
That SR stands for the scientific name of the species that we're right, uh, raising, so Seriola rivoliana, and then the number is the batch number. So for instance, I assisted in developing the 32nd and 33rd batch of fish, which is SR32 and SR33. In this presentation, I'm going to uh, discuss more in detail the approaches and outcomes as they uh, relate to each of those departments, as well as touch on the uh, facilities filtration system. So to start off, we're just gonna discuss some universal approaches that are uh, used pretty universally uh, within the uh, facility. Um, so the first of which would be cleaning of the tanks as well as their associated components to remove uh, organic matter such as feed or waste products. And the accumulation of these products can lead to bacterial growth, which will in turn increase uh, disease prevalence within those individual tanks, as well as the decomposition of this matter by uh, bacteria can release ammonia, which is harmful to fish health, reproduction, and overall survival. Regarding uh, the water quality parameters that we will monitor and adjust, um, Blue Ocean Mariculture operates using a flow-through water circulation system. So the, uh, the environment within the tanks reflect that of the local environment of which these fish are adapted to. One thing that we will uh, monitor directly is temperature as it uh, plays an integral role in influencing fish metabolism and overall growth. This will rarely be changed, except when we are intentionally slowing metabolism within chill tanks, which is something I'm gonna discuss more uh, down the road in this presentation. We also will uh, extensively manage dissolved oxygen concentrations due to the high density of the animals that are present within these tanks. And this is done using ceramic diffusers, which will um, integrate uh, dissolved oxygen into those tanks, as well as the use of uh, oxygen probes just to maintain those ideal ranges throughout these animals stay uh, within the hatchery. And then finally, salinity will only be altered within uh, the production of rotifer live feeds. And this is done uh, to enhance the production of those animals. We will also um, feed uh, these species uh, unique uh, schedule as well as composition to match their individual needs. And this is both vary by department as well as um, the species that is being raised as well as their individual uh, life history stage that they are currently in development. This is done to optimize the health uh, for, uh, growth as well as uh, gamete production specifically within the broodstock. And it's done in a manner that will intentionally limit the waste of feeds to enhance the sustainability of the hatchery. So the first department that we're gonna uh, look at is broodstock where this kind of whole process begins. Again, the overarching purpose is to produce large quantities of high quality fertilized eggs. This is done by breaking up these uh, fish into what's known as genetic groups, which will maximize their diversity and minimize inbreeding within each specific tank. And then we will cycle these animals through a uh, reproductive and a resting phase. And during their resting phase, we will lower the temperatures, which will slow their metabolism, as well as reproductive output. This will allow these animals to accumulate all the energy and nutrients that are uh, vital to enhancing their future egg quality uh, that they will produce down the road. And then they will be cycled back into a reproductive phase where we will warm those waters back up for them and get them uh, more reproductively active. So each day begins with a collection of spawns. This is done by turning off the aeration and oxygenation to these tanks. And this will reduce the water column mixing. And since these eggs are positively buoyant, they will rise to the top of the water where they are very easily collected by a skimmer arm, which will transport these eggs to an egg collector, which will just house them until we can uh, process all the spawns. And for processing, we will uh, determine a, a number of metrics, such as the uh, provide estimates on the total number of eggs that were produced within each spawn, as well as fertilization rates. And we'll also look at uh, indicators of egg quality, which would be uh, in the form of egg or oil globule uh, diameter, as well as oil globule retention rates. And you might be wondering, what the heck is oil globule retention rates? <laughs> so in this image here, you can see uh, the uh, egg with indicated as A has that nice intact sphere. 
within the uh, egg itself, that is its oil globule. And this is compared to either uh, eggs in B or C, where you can see that uh, globule is shattered and there's all those like different little bubbles within the egg. And then finally, we will uh, treat these eggs uh, for potential pathogens, just reducing the levels of those pathogens by um, disinfecting them prior to transfer into uh, the larval rearing department, just to enhance biosecurity uh, as best we can. So here is a quick video of one of my favorite activities uh, within the hatchery. This was um, feeding of these broodstock animals. Uh, I think you'll get an appreciation for just how like awesomely powerful and uh, just charismatic they are. And as you can probably imagine, whoever's doing the feeding will not come out of this process dry. You are for sure <laughs> soaked after. Um, so unfortunately, fish can actually injure themselves during these feeding or spawning events. Uh, as you can see, they're quite violent, active um, activities for them. Um, and if these animals are injured, this can limit their gamete quality and production. If we notice that an animal is injured, we will monitor their swimming and feeding behavior over several days. And if no uh, signs are, or no indicators showing that they are improving are observed, they will unfortunately be uh, euthanized following a USDA approved protocol, which will quick and painlessly uh, euthanize that animal. Um, we will then collect various weight measurements on total fish biomass, uh, as well as uh, their weights of their viscera, gonads, and liver. Uh, this will just provide uh, insights into uh, the animal's overall health, as well as reproductive potential. Gives us great feedback on uh, the management in inputs that we're putting into that department. Uh, just how effective are they? I had the uh, really unique opportunity of getting to uh, assist in the integration of 40 new, uh, or approximately 40 new wild caught fish into the broodstock department. And this was done in an effort to enhance the genetic diversity, as well as the number of genetic groups present within the program, which just allows for even more prolonged rest periods between spawns. So again, further accumulation of those nutrients, better egg quality down the road. To do this, we will uh, sedate these fish using an FDA approved marine fin fish anesthetic, just to ease the handling and processing where we will sex these animals. We will um, apply a pit tag so we can identify them in the future using a handheld sensor as shown in the image. And then we will also obtain a uh, fin clip for a genetic analysis. This will not only allow us to maximize the diversity of genetic group placements, but also um, perform parentage assignments down the road to identify uh, potentially strong or weak genetic contributors based on their offspring's performance. To uh, end this process, we will place these animals in a freshwater quarantine tank just uh, for several minutes, just to remove any parasites that may be present on their bodies before we uh, integrate them fully into the roadstock program. Again, hammering home the importance of biosecurity. Moving over to the live feeds department, um, I only worked in rotifer production, so that's what I will speak on today. There's also Artemia. Uh, but within the rotifer uh, department, we will uh, begin each day by sampling the tanks where these rotifers are held. And these tanks are commonly re referred to as cones, which is what you'll hear me uh, use when I'm discussing this. And we will uh, provide estimates on their mobility as well as the debris present within their water. Uh, again, just insights into that animal's health as well as the quality of their environment. We will provide estimates of population size to inform the amount of algal feed that is required uh, to be added to these tanks to sustain further growth. And uh, we will also determine their fertility rates. Um, and then this paired with population size will give us an idea of which cones we are going to, uh, we are going to enrich for larval uh, feeding the next day or which ones we are going to split into two separate new uh, cultures which will kind of restart that growth process for them. And one of the, oh, app was supposed to be there, my bad. One of the uh, major things that we do here is the formulation as well as administering these enrichments. 
which is given again to that culture that is going to be fed out to larval rearing the following day. Um, and the amount of enrichment that is added is going to be based on the population size that is going to be fed out. And this is a really integral step because it provides the essential nutrients and vitamins that are deficient within rotifers, but are essential to uh, larval fish development, particularly within those early stages of development. And um, <clears throat> So a typical day, we will have uh, three separate harvests of these rotifer cones. The first one will commence first thing in the morning of that enriched tank to be fed out uh, to larval rearing as soon as we can possibly uh, put that out. The other one will be a uh, harvested and enriched overnight. And then finally, again, one will be harvested and split into two uh, new cultures to restart that growth process. And so the process begins with uh, image A, where a cone is fully drained into this harvester that has a 55 micron uh, screen that is permeable to the debris, but not rotifers themselves. Image B, we will uh, rinse these cultures to remove any unwanted debris. So uh, until we end up with a really clean culture as shown in C, where we will condense these cultures and that just eases the handling of all these animals to their uh, final locations. As shown in D, we will put them into these buckets and physically transfer them to either larval rearing or their new tanks within the live feeds department. So hopping into the uh, larval rearing department, uh, again, responsible for hatching larvae from eggs and raising them until they can be transferred into the nursery habitat, which takes approximately 40 to 50 days post hatch. And during this time, we will administer health checks to monitor their development uh, throughout these really susceptible stages of their lives. One thing that we'll do, oh, sorry, getting ahead of myself. Uh, we will randomly sample 10 fish per tank per day and observe them under a dissecting microscope. We will look for uh, stomach fullness as well as composition, which will uh, indicate to us, are these larvae feeding? And if so, are they, what are they feeding on? Are they successfully transitioning their diets from that early stage larval, uh, sorry? that rotifer uh, culture to artemia, which is uh, more nutritional, and then finally to a dry pellet feed. During the time, we will also look at the development of key anatomical organs, such as a swim bladder, which just provides insights into their overall health and development. And then finally, we will look for the presence of disease, more specifically epithelial cystis, which is a bacterial infection commonly found within the gills and skin of these larvae, uh, which you can see in the image of this poor larvae there. That's not one of the ones that we had at Blue Ocean, uh, it's just an image I found online, but all these like black cysts that you see on it is that bacterial infection. And unfortunately this guy is not doing so well. And by the conclusion of this uh, larval rearing process, the department aims to transfer approximately 250,000 one gram fish into the nursery where they will undergo a grading process uh, during this time, fish are inspected by technicians uh, for various uh, deformities, diseases, as well as uh, inadequate growth. Ultimately, we will restrict placement to only the best 140,000 to remain within the nursery. And this is done in an effort that will promote survival rates within the nursery, while also reducing the use of resources on underperforming fish that may not potentially survive, as well as enhancing the quality of that final seafood product that we are able to produce. Within the nursery, uh, something that we do uh, often is determining the feed conversion ratios, which is essentially a metric of how efficiently are these fish converting the feed that we are administering to them into actual body tissue. To do this, we will collectively weigh 100 fish per tank two to three times per week. And this will give us an average fish weight for that tank. And then when we pair that information with the amount of feed that has been administered, this will give us uh, our feed conversion ratio. And this not only gives us an idea of how efficient uh, production is for that specific cohort, but it will also inform the amount of ration feed that is uh, administered to intentionally chilled tanks. And so during the production of SR32, uh, we intentionally chill these tanks to slow their growth 
and obtain a more even weight distribution across the nursery. This was done for three uh, separate reasons, one of which it promotes a consistency of development offshore. It will also limit larger fish aggression on their smaller counterparts and ensures that these fish do not outgrow their nursery tanks before we are able to transfer them offshore. So to do this again, we're gonna reduce the temperature of their environments and uh, while also feeding them a rationed amount of feed uh, just to meet their base metabolic requirements uh, and limit their growth rates. And the minimum growth rate that we will go to is uh, 3%, which will just ensure that fish health as well as performance is not negatively impacted during this time. And during the daily cleanings of these tanks, we will um, remove dead fish from their environments and inspect them for signs of disease. The most prevalent of which will be a tenacibaculum bacterial infection that creates very noticeable open sores, as you can see on this Chilean trout from a hatchery in Chile. And uh, <clears throat> once an infection has been identified, we will remove those infected individuals from their tanks and then treat that tank following USDA and FDA approved protocols. Finally, once fish, fish are, uh, once the juvenile fish are approximately 30 grams, we will prepare them for offshore transfer. So those chill tanks will slowly be acclimated to ambient seawater temperatures at a rate of one degree Celsius per day. This is done to uh, mitigate the effects of thermally induced stress, which could impair immune function. So something we desperately want to avoid. We will then uh, uh, determine the final weight distributions by doing individual weight samples. So again, another 100 fish per tank. And then we will transfer these animals. Uh, so to do this, we will place them into a condenser cage, which is that triangular object you see me pouring fish into, which will artificially increase the density of uh, those fish. And then that will ease the uh, suction which um, is done with this yellow tube going into that, uh, that condenser cage, which is a uh, fish transfer pump inlet, which will transport these animals to a fish counter. So a very interesting water ride for them. <laughs> <laughs> so this will transfer them to a uh, fish counter device, which intuitively enough counts fish. And this is done to, um, really ensure that once they're placed into these transport vehicles that we are not exceeding the life system, uh, the life support systems capabilities, as well as it assists the offshore team when they're physically transferring them into those cages offshore. Ultimately, this will enhance our survival rates throughout this process. Uh, again, improving that overall economic and environmental sustainability of the hatchery. So as most things go, Sometimes things do not go according to plan. And during the production of SR33, we unfortunately experienced a very significant mortality event within the larval rearing department. This uh, began with uh, six days post hatch, we observed uh, quite erratic swimming behavior from these larvae, which within a few short days uh, progressed to large scale mortality. And given the ubiquitous nature of these events, it was hypothesized that. Uh, a water source introduced a potential contaminant or pathogen to these tanks. Uh, in response, we performed various tests and uh, trials, uh, all done at third party locations. So pathology testing include both uh, virology as well as bacteriology. So larvae randomly sampled within these tanks sent off to various labs across the United States for analysis. We also uh, tested our water sources leading into the hatchery using a whole effluent toxicity test, commonly referred to as a wet test, which is a uh, contaminant presence detection test. Uh, this was done at uh, HQ labs on Oahu. They performed the analysis for us. And then finally, we performed larval trials at Ocean Era, which is a, uh, another entity uh, within the National Energy Laboratory of Hawaii Authority. And they have a different water source than what is uh, provided to Blue Ocean Mariculture. And here we hatch larvae and raise them using the same standard operating procedures that we used for both larval rearing and live feeds production. During this time, we also performed various projects related to enhancing the biosecurity of the hatchery. So we completely shut down both the larval rearing and live feeds departments 
which requires a complete disinfection of its surfaces and components, which is followed up with a two week dry out period where entry is prohibited into these departments to just ensure that any pathogens that may have survived that disinfection process are completely eradicated as well as preventing any reintroductions. We also constructed uh, permanent walls just to create a more sealed environment within these two departments, which is also outfitted with a vestibule cleaning area uh, for technicians to properly uh, disinfect prior to entry. Both of these, again, just trying to prevent uh, pathogen introductions in the future. Finally, we performed enhancements to our filtration system. So uh, UV, fil uh, court UV filter court sleeves were replaced. We also replaced the sand within our sand filters and uh, added a carbon filtration system. So talking about the various outcomes of my internship, uh, for the Broodstock, I was trained within this department during that two week dry out period. So we actually had no requirement for their eggs, but we were able to maintain the health of these animals uh, through maintaining their ideal environmental and nutritional demands. And then again, we also integrated those 40 wild caught fish into the program, uh, successfully eradicating those parasites uh, prior to incorporation. Within the live feeds department, we were actually able to accomplish all of the hatchery's expectations. We met larval rearing's demand throughout their extended operational duration of SR33. And at the height of production, we were able to maintain a standing stock of approximately 15 billion rotifers. Finally, towards the end of production, we uh, successfully uh, in formulated and implemented a population uh, reduction plan, which will meet larval rearing feeding requirements, but also limiting the waste of resources on unneeded rotifer cultures. Unfortunately, the larval rearing department, we were not able to achieve our goals um, with respect to SR33, again, due to that extreme mortality event observed uh, within the first 10 days post-hatch. Again, given that ubiquitous nature, we hypothesized that water contamination or pathogen introduction was a potential cause, uh, prompting all that testing and trials that we did. Within the nursery, we were able to successfully facilitate fish growth and health throughout SR32's development by meeting both their water quality standards as well as their feeding demands, which was done in, an, uh, uh, in a way that minimized the waste of these feeds. Any tenacibaculum infections that were found were successfully eradicated uh, within the tanks and those infected individuals were removed from the program. And then finally, the hatchery and offshore team were able to transport approximately 120,000 healthy juvenile fish offshore for future grow out. Regarding the trials and testing that we conducted uh, in response to that mortality event, the trials were inconclusive. However, larval health did resemble that of SR33, which indicates uh, that a difference in the water source as well as site were not significant in improving larval health overall. Pathology tests were also inconclusive as pathogen tests, uh, pathogens were discovered within some of the samples, but not all. And again, given that all of the uh, larvae that were sampled exhibited that uh, same uh, behavior and mortality, it was determined that whatever was causing SR33's demise would be found in all of the samples sent. Uh, the wet test or the whole effluent toxicity test uh, indicated that water toxicity was actually a contributing factor as the water supplies that were sampled exhibited poor quality standards. Again, given the nature of this test, this is a contaminant or presence detection test and is not able to uh, specifically identify that uh, individual contaminant or contaminants. And uh, again, this prompted the installation of those carbon filters in an effort to remediate the effects that uh, these contaminants were having on the larval health. Again, I would like to reiterate that the exact cause or causes of this event is not definitively known by Blue Ocean Mariculture, and it would take significantly more testing um, and trials to uh, identify those uh, potential sources. Regarding the projects, so both larval rearing and live feeds departments were uh, successfully disinfected and dried out 
in preparation of the production of the next cohort of fish. The filtration systems improvements we're completing, so replacing those existing filter components, as well as the installation of that new carbon filter system. And then uh, finally, the sealed wall and vestibule areas were finished to uh, mitigate future pathogen introductions. With regard to the uh, broader implications of my work at Blue Ocean Agriculture, all of our uh, communal work within the hatchery, the development of uh, and successful transfer of SR33 allowed the company to stay on track with its production schedule, uh, as well as meeting the company's demands for their products. This also provides funds for Blue Ocean Mariculture to continue producing those sustainable seafood products while also uh, developing their practices and facilities. The integration of that new broodstock fish into the program will uh, create significant long-term impacts to uh, improving a quality uh, as well as the efficacy of future production. <clears throat> the enhancements to biosecurity within the hatchery will mitigate future pathogen introductions and uh, the installation of that carbon filter system will improve the environmental quality within the larval rearing department. And it's actually believed to have remedied a potential cause of SR33's larval rearing issues because following the installation of this system, the hatchery has actually been able to produce and successfully transfer several cohorts of fish offshore for grow out. Finally, uh, I believe that Blue Ocean Mariculture can serve as a model for future facility development and site planning. Um, physical oceanographic properties play an integral role into the function of your facility, as well as their uh, potential impacts on local environments. This highlights the importance of proper site planning to reduce local nutrient enrichment or other uh, factors that could, could, could contribute to habitat degradation which will significantly reduce an operation's overall ecological footprint. And by using uh, ecosystem processes to their advantage, Blue Ocean Mariculture has demonstrated the potential to integrate sustainable practices that are not only environmentally conscious, but also economically viable. So that was a ton of information, a little amount of time. I would be happy to answer any questions. Uh, if you wanna send me an email later on, uh, here's my information. Before I wrap up, I would just like to give a really special thanks to uh, my committee members, Federico and Lisa, as well as uh, CEO Dick Jones and the rest of Blue Ocean Maricultures Management, as well as the hatchery team. Uh, finally, my awesome cohort that I got to, uh, you know, go through my graduate studies with, as well as my uh, friends and family outside of the program who have just really supported me uh, all along the way. Mahalo. So I'd like to open up the floor to a question or two. We're a little bit uh, in a schedule, but please ask away. <laughs> so when you, because these fish are raised in such sterile environments, do you see high rates of disease when you move them offshore or are they kind of too old? Yeah, um, so they're not uh, within like fully sterilized environments. Um, within the uh, nursery and uh, broodstock departments, they receive less filtration. Um, so they're actually getting, you know, seawater uh, throughout those departments. Um, personally, I did not work in the offshore side of things, so I can't really speak to their uh, disease transmission rates or anything. But I mean, they, it wasn't, um, disease is not a, a huge factor within the hatchery, at least. Um, during normal production. Obviously, we had some issues while I was there. Cool. Um, oh, yeah. I was, I was just curious. Um, what is the, like, for the initial stages of the bootstock and all that, like, where you have the issues of the S SR33, um, where do you get your water? Is it just ocean water? Or, like, is it, like, near shore? Or is it yeah. So we're uh, located within um, OTEC, which, uh, the National Energy Laboratory of Hawaii Authority. They have uh, pumps and pipes that are uh, outfitted within the ocean and that bring seawater into uh, various facilities within um, that location, one of which is Blue Ocean. So that's where they get their sea surface water as well as their deep ocean water. All right, All right. well, thank you very much. <laughs>